Amen. Well, feel free and be seated. Thank you guys so much. I just want to share some exciting news. If you didn't hear about last night, uh, about a year and a half ago, we welcomed in the Future Rio Church with Brian Palmer and his launch team that they were growing and developing. And last night, they had their very first launch, uh, their very first service as an official church. It was so exciting. There was 115 people, kids, adults, <laughs> leaders, volunteers, guests. It was so exciting. I mean, imagine this. In Old Town, just a year and a half ago, there was no evangelical church right in that community. And so I saw people from the neighborhood there. I saw excitement going on. I saw God at work. And I just wanted to share that with you guys. What a great victory that is for the kingdom of God. Just think, our church, that's small and growing, we were there not too long ago. Our very first launch Date, our very first service, we had 92 people. And so the sky's the limit for what God can do in Old Town. So let's take time to pray for that church and for them. Uh, Jesus, we know that there's a lot of exciting things going on in Old Town. That there's well-wishers, people who came as guests. But Lord, I pray that you might even burden and put on people's hearts a desire to want to be a part and serve there and get that church going. Lord, I pray that they could have a huge impact in that area. I know from our experience, there's a lot of exciting momentum in the days ahead that would on their way, Lord, that they carve out just a difference of who's going to be the church, who's going to stick around, who's going to serve, who's going to be a part, and who's going to reach out to the community. So God, I pray that you'd make that clear and that you'd keep the momentum and excitement going for that area. And God, that you do a great work, one that only you get the glory and credit for in Old Town. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I'm so excited to share that with you, but I'm very excited to talk to you about our new series called New Creation. We're going to spend some time looking at the new life, the new home, the new heart, the new mind, and the new spirit that God wants to implant inside of a believer. When you become a Christian, you don't just get heaven. There is so much more that's involved there. This is a good season to begin this series as we are starting a brand new year. The year 2017 probably offers hope for many in this room. The year 2017 does that we desire it to look differently than last year. Many of you have made resolutions. You made some resolutions to go to the gym, maybe attend church more frequently, read your Bible, memorize a verse a month, start your prayer calendar, maybe journaling, looking to work out, eat correctly, lessen some things in your life. You made these resolutions as a heart's desire to see change in your life and in your home. Our family went through that this week. We did what we call the Great Toy Purge of 2017. And the deal is, this year, we purged all the adult toys. The kids are doing pretty good. They've got their toys organized, put away. They use the ones that they love. But this year, we went through every crevice, every corner, and every space in our house. Have you guys done this? You create your pile, right? You've got your Goodwill pile right there. You, you just know there's no way you're going to keep that. You're donating that to some organization. You just you even got a section in the garage. It's just a, you should put a sign that says Goodwill because it just continues to get filled up. You've got your Goodwill pile, and, and then you've got your like good board pile, right? The one where you're looking. Why do we still have a laser disc player at our house? What are we doing with this? Or maybe a VHS for some of you younger folks, or compact disc player or DVD, but you know, you don't just get on Amazon and order your movies like you used to in the old days, and you've got that, that pile, and then, then you've got your get rid of pile, right? Uh, bags and bags full of stuff that you are just chucking and getting rid of, and then you look at all this newfound space in your house, and so you make your way to Target or Walmart to get all your organizational tool, tools, right? You go to get those boxes, and, and you're like, oh my gosh, that was like $700 in organizational organizational equipment that we just bought. We need to have a garage sale, but it's too cold to have a garage sale, and we're just getting rid of it, so we're going to get rid of it all. It's going to go away. We're going to give it to Goodwill. You're going to say, out with the old and in with the new. Now you have space for all of the new things you got for Christmas or the things that you're going to fill your house up with this 
next year. You want to say out with the old and in with the new. And some of you guys feel that way with 2016, kind of like Lucy from Charlie Brown. She was complaining to Charlie Brown about the year. And he says, well, aren't you having a good new year? And she's in the beginning of the new year. And she says, you know what? This new year sure feels like a used year to me, right? That maybe some of us feel like this beginning of a new year sure looks a whole lot like last year. It's just a continuation from the same struggles, the same obstacles and difficulties. And every year, we all have that chance to say out with the old and in with the new. My barista at coffee this week says, uh, you're going to have a lot of people at church this Sunday? I said, yeah, we'll pick up a few. It's like, she said, well, good luck. I said, you know, churches don't really need good luck on January. That, that's a time when people go back. It's like gyms and churches and goodwill. There's tons of stuff there, tons of people. It's like, we don't really need luck there, but... They said, well, how long will they last? I said, oh, a few weeks, and they might come back month after month. But I'll tell you what, our church, we've seen people come, making resolutions, saying, you know what, I'm going to go to church more often. I'm going to bring my family to church. And that's how we've seen God grow our church. Seasons like right now, January, August, where there's excitement and there is new things on the horizon where you're getting back into your routines. So we have a unique opportunity here at Anchor, say out with the old and in with the new. Maybe some of you are here and you want to see God begin to take you on a journey of growth spiritually. And before you can make any resolution, before you can make any kind of commitment or surrender to God spiritually, you have to understand and know who you are whom you belong to, and where your future is. And so in the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, Paul writes to a group of people that he longs to see grow and gain in their understanding about God, about humanity, and about their eternal destiny. See, this day and age that this letter was written was a day and age where all kinds of false teachers were creeping in. They were riding the wave of this new Christianity and preaching a false gospel, a false narrative according to the word of God. And so they were putting in their own ideas about what people's lives should look like, what the eternal life will look like, about the, the body, the mind, and the soul, what that is. There's all kinds of wild and crazy ideas that even permeate today, thousands of years later, we're still asking that question about where do you go when you die? Do you have a spirit or a soul? Is that different than your mind? And so Paul writes to kind of address the sin issues and the doctrine issues of these false teachers that have crept in. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 10, I want to read those over you so you can listen in, you can follow along. It's on page 966 in the free Bibles that we hand out. And if you don't have a Bible, please grab one on your way out. It's on the table back there. You can just follow along on the screens as well. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we were still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would not, or that we would be further clothed. So that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For if we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Now in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 10, Paul establishes... His perspective driven by the Holy Spirit of God on the body, the soul, and the afterlife. 
You know, when you become a new creation in Christ, there's several things that God promises you. And we're going to look at four of those things this morning. Becoming a new creation, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, tells us that we are given a new body. Look again with me in verse 1 of chapter 5. It says, For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Verse 1 tells us that in the afterlife, we will be given a new body. Paul's ultimate aim and his goal is not justification. It's not being justified before God, saying that you are now considered right in the eyes of God, that once you were in darkness, an enemy of God, that you were opposed to God, that you were not in his family. But when you give your life to Christ and surrender and you ask for forgiveness of your sins, that Jesus, by his power and his work on the cross and the resurrection, that actually forgives you of your sins, frees you of an eternal destiny towards hell, and places you in the eye and perspective of God is justified. You are right before God. That's not Paul's ultimate goal here. It's not even to be sanctified. That process that occurs after you become a Christian, where you're wrestling with, you're like, I know I became a Christian. I know I'm forgiven. I know I'm going to heaven. But you know what? I still struggle with greed and bad language and lust. And I still struggle with all these sins. And so the rest of your life, from the point of salvation until you breathe your last breath here on earth, God is going to use the circumstances of life to draw out in you and refine you and bring the act of sanctification in your life so that you become more like Christ. Paul's ultimate goal is not sanctification here. It's glorification. To have what the Bible would allude to as your glorified body. See, in heaven, God's going to give you a new body. Becoming a new creation means that you have something to look forward to in heaven. And that's that you will have a new body. It's like the old church song where the men and the women would rotate singing. And the women would sing out. They would sing loud and proud. In heaven we're going to have a new body. And the men would sing and follow with, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Then to which the women would reply, we're going there soon, we're going there soon. The men would reply, we're going there soon. And the women would then say, praise the Lord. I get rid of those dirty dog men. But in heaven, we get new bodies. I'm only 35 years old. And I find myself saying things like, because I said so, that's why. I find myself saying, hold on, give me a minute, I've got to get up. Uh, I find myself saying things like, oh, man, my body hurts, it aches, it groans. And that's because the bodies that we have here on earth are on a constant state of decay. The second law of thermodynamics is applied to us. We will decay. Our bodies are broken. They will end in death one day. That we have a one-to-one -one ratio right now for death. Life and one day you will die. Unless the resurrection occurs, you will die. So Paul calls that body here on earth that you live in a tent. Paul was, was considered an itinerant minister. He traveled preached the gospel. He went all over the world on missionary journeys. And Paul would fund his ministry through making of tents. He was a tent maker. Sometimes you hear about a pastor who's bivocational, right? They, they work two jobs, and their job is to be a pastor, and they might sell cars during the day to pay the bills. Well, Paul was one of those very first bivocational ministers that worked in the marketplace to provide for his ministry. Now, he also received gifts from people like the Philippians and others, but Paul referred to his body and our body says this illustration that he was very familiar with. He called it a tent. Now, we bought sleeping bags for Christmas this year for our three little girls, and they were excited to get sleeping bags, but what it meant for them was that they get to go camping this summer, because last summer we said, let's go camping. We realized we were very ill-prepared for a camping trip, and it didn't happen. And so now we're prepared. We've got bags. We've got tents. 
We've got those inflatable beds. I mean, we are ready to go. I've got an axe. I mean, we're going to take some fire. It's going to be great. But the thing about camping is it doesn't last very long. You set up your tent, and it's temporary. It's not permanent. It's meant to come down. And so Paul refers to your earthly body, the one that you might hope will get 75, 80, maybe even 90 years of use. That body is temporary. It feels like it's permanent. In our minds, we never think about dying today or tomorrow. We think about our future. We think about the plans we have for this year. We think about paying off the mortgage. We think about all the things we can do with our lives or having children and walking them down the aisle. We think in such permanent terms, but Paul's saying your body is temporal. It's a tent. One day it will go away. And he refers to the body in heaven as a building. He gives an illustration, a metaphor, to display and show that there's more permanency to it. That in heaven, you'll be given a fully glorified body. I like to think of it as my Superman suit. Right? In heaven, where, uh, except there's no kryptonite in heaven, right? You know, the book of Revelation gives a description of the afterlife, and we see there's no pain, no crying, no tears, no Hurt. Our, our bodies won't go through the physical stress. They won't go through the emotional stress. They won't go through the difficulties that we have here on earth. In heaven, we'll be given a glorified body. How exciting. A glorified body where we get to explore the new heaven and the new earth. A glorified body that we get to praise God forever in. A glorified body that's not going to get bored, won't be broken, and will not waste away. A glorified body where we get to eat whatever we want and we don't have to count calories, right? A glorified body that does not need to make a resolution every year. A glorified body that is going to be used to glorify God with for all of eternity. Well, that's the first thing. Look at the second one with me. Verses 2 through 4 tell us that we now have a new life. We're going to have a new life. It's, it's a little tricky here, okay? Because it says, for in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. We want to get to heaven. It says, if indeed, and Paul uses this word if instead of when, because I believe Paul was convinced that he thought the second coming of Christ was coming so rapidly, so soon, that he wasn't going to die. He was just trying to get out there and spread the message as fast as he could. Because he thought that maybe the Lord would return and take him home. And we know from history that we've still got some time before that happens. Okay, It says, if indeed, by putting it on, we may not be found naked. I like it when I see words like that in the Bible. Makes me giggle just a little bit, right? You know, I've been studying through Psalms and Proverbs this year and listening to an audio Bible. I got through Ecclesiastes and turned on Song of Solomon with Faith Comes by Hearing here in town. The third largest Bible app here in the world. They have over 90 million subscribers and they have audio versions. There's music and narration and you get to the book of Song of Solomon, and that just becomes weird when you're listening to somebody else read it to you, right? There's a guy voice and a girl voice, and it's a very intimate book about love and the intimacy that's shared between a husband and a wife. And so it always makes me giggle when I see words like that in the Bible, and I hear words like that. We come to this word here. It says, if indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. Now, the metaphor that's being used is your body, Okay. It's talking about the afterlife here. When, when this says to be found naked, it's saying soulless, okay? That you may not be found soulless. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, verse 4. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed. So the idea of being naked is that you don't get to go to heaven. That you don't have that in store for you. So to be clothed by Christ, the new creation, you have got a new body and you have a new life in heaven. It says here that being further clothed so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. 
this temporal, mortal life that we have here on earth, the little dash in between the dates of our birth and our death that will go on our tombstone, that little small dash is mortal. It's going to be swallowed up by a new life in heaven. God's going to give you a new body, and he is going to give you a new life. Man, for some of us, that is a sigh of relief. We look back on the many years that we have lived, or maybe we're going through a storm, a chaotic season, a season of great obstacle and difficulty, and we have a hope that our new life in heaven will be incredible, that it will be different. You know, this is a broken, fallen world, and so many of us suffer from grief, the loss of a loved one. We go through personal illness, financial ruin, broken relationships, and in heaven, none of that will exist. Our new life will be clothed by God, and we'll get to glorify God with it for the rest of our lives. Well, verse 5 gives us an indication of what else is in store for us as a new creation. It says, he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. To be a follower of Jesus means that you are given a new Spirit, and it is the Holy Spirit. If you see on the screen here or in your Bible, that's a capital S. I always talk with our kids about ghouls and goblins and ghosts. <laughs> And how there's no validity to that. That the only spirit that we need to be worried about is the Holy Spirit of God. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you don't have to worry about demon possession. You don't have to worry about ghouls and goblins. You don't have to worry about any of that spiritual world that's being propagated today. Because you have a guarantee in the form of the Holy Spirit of God. God's very spirit seeks to indwell you, live inside of you, and be with you. Ephesians 1 tells us about that guarantee. That brings a lot of security to know. You say, I want that new body. I want that new life in heaven. But you know what? I still struggle. I still sin. I wonder if I'll be worthy of salvation and a new body and a new life. Well, you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about, is there going to be a secret sin that's going to keep me from heaven? You don't have to worry about, am I going to trip up right before I die? Like a, a bus is coming on and it's a head-on collision. And right before, I'm going to say a gigantic cuss word because I know that my life is going to die right before my eyes. You're going to, I didn't have to have the time to ask for forgiveness. You don't have to worry about that. The Spirit of God is your guarantee. You say, well, gosh, sin can't be in heaven. God doesn't allow sin in heaven. It's a perfect, holy place with no crying, no pain, no suffering. How is that possible? It's because of the work of Christ. He died on the cross and rose from the grave, guaranteeing to cover and remove your sin, <coughs> past, present, and future. That's the security we have. We have a new spirit. The spirit of God seeks to live inside of us. And finally, verses 6 through 8, we see this. So we are always of good courage. And that word courage, some translations will say cheer. I mean, we are always of good courage. There's nothing that can really get us down because of this. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. Okay, this is not saying that the Spirit of God is not with you. This is saying that the Heavenly Father who is in heaven and Jesus who is seated at his right hand, that that is an eternal place of dwelling, the abode of God, that that place exists and he is present there simultaneously by his spirit. He is present here inside of each believer. But we know that we're not with God. We know that we don't have those glorified bodies yet. We don't have that new life in heaven yet for us. We know that we are separate. So verse 6 says, we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, while we're in our tent, this temporary place, we are away from the Lord. Verse 7, for if we walk by faith, not by sight. We can't see God. We can't touch the physical body of God. 
We can't experience God in such a way where the disciples experienced Jesus when he took himself as deity and put flesh on and came into this earth. But in heaven, we will get to do that. Verse 9 says, so whether we are at home or away, we will make it our aim to please God. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. The last thing that we see here is that being a new creation guarantees us that we have a new home. A brand new home. I moved into a house. It was a new home for me. I say, I'm buying a new house, but it's not new. It was 17 years old. My house at the time was so old that we purchased it. In our backyard, we overlooked it, but there were telephone jacks in the backyard. There's about four telephone jacks, not a single electrical outlet. You can't plug in and do your bushes to trim them. It's got telephone phone cord jacks because the previous owner had that nice landline with the giant long cord, right? The one when you were in middle school and you're trying to talk to a girl on the phone and you'd carry the whole phone with that long 75 foot cord and go underneath the door and you'd get in your closet and you'd talk and mom would get on the phone and say, it's time to get off the phone, Jerry, right? And you, you, she had that in the backyard. So when she's doing yard work, the phone rings, she could answer it, she could hear it ring. The house was not new. We called it a new home. It's only new when you build it from the ground up. My uncle is building a house right now, and he's going through every meticulous portion of building the house, and when he steps in, that will be a new home. We have a home here on earth, but it's our temporary residence. Jesus said, I'm going to leave now. I'm going to leave my time here on earth as God with skin on. And I'm going to heaven to prepare a place for you. In the book of John, John the Apostle writes about this. Chapter 14 is a powerful passage about our heavenly dwelling and relationship that we have with God. Jesus is preparing. He is building a new home for us. This is a qualitatively brand new heaven and a new earth. It's not being renovated. It's not some old heaven and old earth that's been sitting for thousands of years waiting for the climax of the planet earth and our time here to come to an end. This is a brand new heaven and a new earth. One that is untainted. One that is pure. A heavenly home for each of us who believe in Jesus. That is good news. Two things that I want you to walk away with today. Okay, Understanding who you are as a new creation means that you're going to get a new body. You're going to have a new life. You've got a new spirit. And you've got a new home awaiting for you. So if you're a follower of Jesus... Picture yourself as Max Lucado writes about being on an airplane, landing in paradise, and grabbing hold of your arm rails and telling the stewardess, the flight attendants, the pilot, I'm sorry, I just want to stay on this plane and eat some more peanuts. <laughs> That's what it's like when we live for this life. When we live for this home, this body, when our kingdom is the only focus, we're telling God paradise awaits, a new home awaits, but we are okay with staying here. This is not some kind of morbid suicidal statement I am trying to issue. This is a proclamation that each of us should live with an eternal perspective. The believer should see their new home, their new life, their new spirit, and their new body that awaits them as their aim. This life is not Paul's goal, and nor should it be ours. We should live with an eternal perspective. The second part for you here today is maybe you don't know Jesus. You've never given your life to Christ. You never ask God to forgive you of your sin. You don't know if you have the spirit of God as a guarantee for salvation. 
Today is a day to sum that up, to make sure that you can have access to the heavenly home that God wants to give you. The new body and the new life and his Holy Spirit he wants to give you. The Bible tells us that that is an open invitation. God doesn't play favoritism. He doesn't exclude the invitation from anybody. That it's available for all. But it's only through Jesus that that is made possible. If you want that new home, the new body, the new life, if you're tired of this earth and you realize I've got to live for something more, maybe today is the day you start your 2017 like never before. Father, we come to you this morning, Lord, and we ask that today could be a day where those who don't know you come to faith in Christ. That right now they would say loudly with their heart and their mind, and they would pray to you and they would say, God, I need you. Please forgive me of my sin. God, this world is wonderful. I do love life here on earth, but there sounds like there's something way better in store for me. God, I, I want that. I look at the struggles that I face, the difficulties here on this earth, and Lord, I realize there's got to be more. So God, I confess to you that I'm a sinner and in need of you. Would you forgive me of my sin, transform my life, and would you save a spot for me in heaven that I might worship and glorify you with my eternal life forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, guys, thank you so much for being here. Last week, we made the announcement of uh, Andy stepping down from paid staff and just moving into a role of volunteerism. You wonder, will we see Andy more? Yes, he'll continue to be a part and he'll be scheduled. Uh, and Jared will lead us as he did this morning. And so there'll be some time of transition. But, you know, I wanted Andy to come up and uh, just share a few words. We've done something on uh, the back table at the end of service today. We announced last week that we do a little reception for Andy and Casey and Brenna and uh Karis, that they that we could say, you know, we love them and thank them for their service as a staff member. And so we want you guys to hug them. Maybe uh, if you have a card or something to give to them, you can do that this week or the weeks to come. And uh, you can leave them on that back table. So, Casey, there's some flowers for you. There's uh, candy flowers for Brenna. She can eat it all right before bedtime. Um, Karis, we didn't really get anything. But uh, there's a picture on there. Um, I, I found a picture that I really loved. It was of Andy leading us at Christmas Eve with our church and uh, it's really cool and so we want to give that to you along with a bible please take a look at the table uh, it's a beautiful bible with your name on there and anchor church and so we want to say thank you so much and last week we told you i love you and so thankful for helping us start the church and continuing on and well why don't you share a few words with us sandy about what god's doing um well this this definitely wasn't uh an easy decision I, i've been here since the very beginning and Jared said many times that I was all in before Tasha was was all in, um, and there was just something that that you know, really God has been pulling me towards something that that I have desired my entire life, and that, that my parents raised me up to believe is that um, as much as possible I should provide for my family. It doesn't have to mean monetarily, but something that my family wants is is to bring my wife home. Um, to be with the kids all day long rather than having to work. And so to be able to do that, I have to have full-time employment that, that will provide for us. And uh, you know, unfortunately, um, Anchor Church just isn't in a place that, that can do that. And so through lots of prayer and lots of hurt and lots of um, trials and, and you know, even at times strain between me and Jared, just trying to figure out where God was pulling me, um, after talking with Jared multiple times, we, we kind of came to the decision that, that maybe God is pulling me away, not from Anchor, but from, from, from this paid vocational ministry at this point. Uh, it doesn't mean that maybe later on down the road, God won't bring me back in, but, but right now, he, my main ministry that God wants me to serve is, is my family. And, um, you know, I told Jared last week, um, you know, my, my wife, we found out recently, is, is pregnant again. And, and so you know, we're going to have three kids, and, and, and you know, we, we want to have her home. Um, 
one thing that, that she grew up with and that I grew up with was having our mother's home with us. Uh, it's not for everybody, but that's something that, that we desire. And so uh, that doesn't mean we're leaving Anchor. Uh, it might mean that every now and then we're not here on a Sunday, you know, be able to go on some vacations, but you know, we'll still be here, we'll still be serving. Casey will still be serving in the children's ministry. I'll still be you know, setting up and, and tearing down at times and, and up here leading when, when Jared needs some help. It's something that I love. It's something that, that brings me joy and how I can serve Christ. But uh, that, that ministry of, of family, that, that ministry of, of love that I can show my wife uh, is, is really where God is, is leading me. So you know, I, I love you guys, and I thank you for the opportunity and, and the ability to lead you in worship and, and worship with you. Um, and Jared, the, the ability to come alongside you and, and be partners uh, in, in this ministry and you know, go from you know, seven people in your, in your living room to, to this and, and another service that we still have to do is, is an amazing thing to see and it's something that I will cherish uh, for the rest of my life. Thank you, buddy. Again, uh, Jesus, we know you can move mountains. We know that you save our souls. I mean, that is a miracle. And Lord, you can do anything. So with the very small faith that we have and possess, we give it to you. And Lord, we ask for your financial blessing and a job for Andy that will provide for his family and give him energy and joy and satisfaction from his work. Uh, God, may you grant that to the Henning family, Lord. And Lord, we ask for future blessing upon him and upon our church during this time of transition. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Andy. All right, guys, you guys have a great week, and be sure and give them a hug and say goodbye. Uh, it's kind of weird saying, don't say bye, just say thank you. How about that? All right, thank you, guys.